uh, training, um, discipling, a lot of other things that would be beneficial, I believe, to all of us, um, and something special here at Ascension. So, with that said, let's go ahead and we'll begin in prayer. And then again, if you want to get up to get something to eat while we're doing it, this is just to be uh, more relaxed and informal. But let us begin. Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful for the good food that we just had, the fellowship and conversations that are happening between us, the introductions to new men in our congregation, and also the generations that are represented here too. May you bless us in our discussions and may your Holy Spirit in each of us press upon us the importance of men being in fellowship together for the sake of the church, for the sake of our families, for the sake of our community. Bless us this evening and knit our hearts together in the one true faith and in the unity and the bond of peace given by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, um, the paper that you have has a name on top, at the top, the Vanguard, as you see up on the slide as well. And I'll explain what the thought is behind that name and what it means. And then break it down into its, its ideas. This is something that was developed and worked on about five or six years ago. And I haven't had much time really to go into it. Um, and now I think it's, it's come to a point where maybe this is the right time maybe to begin something here at Ascension, uh, at least get something down on paper, something started, something we can modify and revise as we go along. But the hardest part is getting a starting point. The hardest part is having something down that you can look at, talk about, make notes on, and find uh, involvement you know, that we all can have involvement uh, in this together. So, Evander. How it came about originally is when I was raising uh, Noah years ago, uh, I realized how insufficient I was in raising him, and I could not, in my thinking, articulate uh, what it was. And of course, this, the sickness drilled this a little bit about because um, I, was, I was ill at the time and thinking, my goodness, if I did leave my family, uh, what condition would they have been in? And I was in a situation where I had to think like that. And with Noah, I realized I don't really know how to define necessarily or even pass along for that matter what it means to be a Christian man, what it means to be a man. And of course, that would be Christian because the definitions are given to us by our Creator. So how can I teach it if I can't clearly articulate it myself? And I would have you think about that a little bit. We probably have ideas about it, and it would relate to our experiences with our own fathers and family dynamics. But could we articulate it in a way that would be consistent among all of us? And is there a way of doing that? What does it look like? How does it happen? I've heard the expressions, well, it's caught, or it's taught. And as I go along, um, I realize both are true. One means by example, the other means by legitimate instruction to what manly things are. And then even more, how can I lead and fulfill my purpose as a shepherd and teacher or a pastor uh, to do the same with the church. You know, to build up the body of Christ to mature manhood. And for our ladies to mature womanhood. Well, I know I'm not alone. And I know that most of us question this. We look at our collapsing society and we realize a lot of it centers right back into this matter. What does it mean to be a man? And then also, in terms of a relationship, as Malachi, the last prophet, spoke, the idea of the hearts of men being turned to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, all of this is really coming into greater play today in, in my life. So questions arise. 
what is a man? What is manhood? What does it look like? How do I become one? How, I, how do I know if I am one? Well, biologically, we already know that question. That's, that's not what we're talking about. Okay. And then how do I pass it on to my sons? Now that I have two. And now that I want what I would want in a man for my daughter, for Isabella. Perhaps one of your sons. So men are searching, men typically want to know what and especially how. How do I do this? And then how do I raise my boys to do the same? So here's one young man's lament I had, I had read. As I reflect back, even though my father was around me, I learned little of what it means to be a man. So how do I become one? When, at age 29, I'm still questioning whether I know what it really means. Never in my life have I felt such a burden as that from the responsibility of being a, quote, man for my family. But what am I supposed to do? It puts me in a place where I'm left to figure all this out somehow. Where can I find a man to be an example for me of real masculinity? I don't know. One young man. So there's need for clarity, direction, certainty, and also an encouragement in it. And what we need to provide, I believe, is a vision of it, if you will. I'll talk about that word a little bit later, because I think there's a right way of understanding a vision and envisioning. And then modeling it. That's the caught portion. I know my sons watch me because I see them imitating me at times. And I know they're watching me closely. And I have to admit, I'm not quite convinced that all that I'm doing is very helpful to them. But I am going to and have been learning to train them. And I know how important it is. I can't tell you how much over these last years being here at Ascension, how important it has become that I spend time with my kids purposefully and especially learning how to speak the word into their ears uh, meaningfully for them. What about rites of progress or rites of passage? I know Pastor Zeroff and I were talking about you know, our, our uh, confirmation system and also whole life catechesis and how do we grow and mature our children, and at what point do we want to recognize them for certain duties and responsibilities that we would expect of them at a certain level of either understanding or age, so they understand that we're going to look at them differently as they get older, and then they have a sense of responsibility for who they have as they go through these. Are there some rites and initiation passages that we could do? in that regard, to bring that back into a collective society like we have. If you go back to European countries and you look at them, we are a mix of so many different people that I think as much as we try to retain our personal heritages, we have, we've become a melting pot. <clears throat> and in many ways, very good. And in some ways, it's been detrimental to our, to our uh, traditions that were meant to pass on important things for my families. So the challenge then is to exhort men, that is you, to stand up and to take your God-given roles, mine too, and these responsibilities, to be committed to being godly men, not just for our sake or what we think of ourselves, but really not even that, but for what God intended for our wives and for our children, our boys and girls. And then be able to do it in such a way carrying on in our God-given duty to preserve that faith here in time as we move it along to the next generation. So, men and boys, fathers and sons, we need a road map for life as King David himself confesses, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So what is this? What is this idea? Okay, well, here's the first part of it. I think we've done a good job of this one already. <laughs> 
free food, every man for himself. That's what we do. We have free food. And uh, that's good, by the way. Our ladies are, are great providers of our food, but we've kind of passed that point. So let's take a look at what the Vanguard is. Just a few visual things. This isn't all of it. It just means parts of it. And we know that, that our identity as men also begins in baptism. It continues on through the hearing of God's word, especially, especially in the family. And then coming back into the divine service for Holy Communion, God's means of grace, word and sacrament, we know that's key. There's times where we do things with our children and we teach them about life, the different adventures that we have. Uh, when it came to looking at a group or a band of brothers working together, it's hard to find that and pictures of it, at least for me, unless it has some sort of military aspect to it. So that's what you see in the bottom down there. What is it? It's about men gathering together in prayer, kneeling in a way that uh, shows our reverence to our God. Or you can stand, you can do different postures. But here, I was moved by what they were doing and how they were connected to one another, but yet in a very uh, humble uh, prostration to God. Pro prostration? Yeah, it's very easy to confuse that with the male thing. Okay, and then also working and building together on projects, this idea of constructing and building and moving forward. Uh, here's what it's not. So you can see, I don't know if you can read what it says up there, you're a grown man and play video games all day, that's nice. So even your cat can figure this one out. Of course, there's a little bit of a problem here when you spend so much time on something that in the end it's only going to go into the grave and rock away anyways. So this uber masculinity. We don't want to be sloths, we just lay around all day, the Bible warns us against that consistently, about the sluggard. It's not about money or our pleasure and all that it can buy us. Obviously, sometimes we can get involved in things that makes us neglect our wives. Uh, I like this one because it says, the feeling, I'm feeling as neglected as the third verse of a hymn. So, Lutherans ought to like that one. And this one, I think, speaks for itself. Oh my goodness. And what, what's happening today with what men are being portrayed as. Oh, I could have even weirder pictures than that, <clears throat> but I thought since you just ate, I didn't want to have anything <laughs> thrown up on the table. The, the thing uh, that I've added in in understanding this is what kinds of relationships are important to us in a men's ministry. There may be more, but the three that came to me, men and sons, okay, we've talked about that. Uh, Pastor Hammer, who we will most likely have here in the spring, I just saw him in, in St. Louis uh, last week when we were chatting about it. Uh, he wrote, nowhere do a man's three drives to procreate, provide, and protect, as you learned in the Man Up book, express themselves more fully than in the rearing of children. And what a neat picture to show that. A child on, the, on his father's shoulders, his, his father carrying him, and yet he's mimicking his father. I can't tell you how important that relationship is. If you were to ask me the most vital relationship that is uh, destroyed and destroying our communities is the lack of fathers with their sons and in the home. Proverbs tells us grandchildren are the crown of the age and the glory of children is their fathers. But notice all the generations basically are included. If you are a grandfather, you're still responsible to God for your grandchildren to the degree that you have access to them and your great-grandchildren. We remain patriarchs for a reason. And that means always consistently praying for all our children and our children's children and on down and encouraging them and our sons to be good fathers to their children. So here, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. The imagery of a father and son praying together, to me, is a powerful symbol. Can you see that? A man and his son in prayer together. That is a warrior posture, if you will, for a Christian. It's a place of battle. 
I like the picture of the Agogi. I like the picture where the wife is watching. I know in many cultures around the world that at certain ages around this time, maybe seven years old or somewhere around there, the boy is taken from the mother and he is brought to the men in group where he, he begins the journey of becoming a man. The point of that is this, that the nurturing of the mother is to be there only for a certain period of time. But he has to become something different to women when he grows to be a mature man. His relationship to women has to change. And the change is what he's going to be when he comes back as a man to marry a woman and to protect her, provide for her, and love her. So there's a moment where that relationship starts to break with the mother. Not fully, not completely, but it changes for a reason. And so the Spartans had what is called an agogi, where the boys learn to become men. It's a bit severe, obviously, if you know anything about it. But I think they were on to something. If there's another way of doing and looking at something like this, that at certain ages, there's certain things that we begin to train our sons in. Keep that in mind, what that might be like, okay? Then we have the other relationship, men and young men. This is where all the men play a role. Even if you don't have sons, or maybe you have old daughters, or maybe you've never been married, this is still your place. And your place is when you are an older man, you are a mentor and a model to the younger men. And this is where we collaborate on our experiences and our gifts and talents. Uh, talents and our occupations, and we begin to hand down life skills to the young men and model that for them. They're the next generation, and it's up to us to help them understand what their roles are going to be. If not, well, just remember, one day they're going to be paying your social security. So that's important that they have to work. Besides this, we have earthly fathers who disciple us and we respect them. Shall we not much more subject, uh, be subject to the Father of the spirits and live? For he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. So men and young men together, working together, mentoring the young men. And finally, we have the iron sharpens iron, <clears throat> and one man sharpens another. Men and men together. So the question, the answer to Cain's question, back in the fourth chapter of Genesis, when he murders his brother Abel, and God asks him, Cain, where is your brother? Do you remember what his answer was? Am I my brother's keeper? Am I my brother's keeper? Do you think there was an answer meant in the recording of that event and that question? I do, because I think the answer to the question is yes. yes. And all of us here are even more brothers in Christ by the bond of the Holy Spirit than we are in our own blood with brothers. So we are one another's keeper. We have a tendency to want to be independent. I understand that. We're our own men. I understand that. But the Lord teaches us something different, that we are one body of Christ, and we are one, and to be one in what we do, what we think, and how we handle one another. So men and men, these are the primary, primary relationships. So what does the word evangard mean, the name? Sounds kind of strange, doesn't it? I did a lot of searching on it. I only found it in one place in the entirety of Google years ago, and it had something to do with an angel or some sort of, uh, what was it? Some sort of name of a doll, uh, some sort of angel that had a name to it uh, that was some sort of doll series that kids could buy and play with. So I thought I was pretty safe using the word. But it's really a word made from two words. <clears throat> so it is a conflation of evangelical and vanguard. And there's a reason for that. Now, evangelical, in the sense of being Lutheran and the Book of Concord, in looking at it, what we mean by that is loyal, or yes, loyal to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So when we talk about ourselves as 
evangelical Lutherans or the evangelical Lutheran Church, we are basically stating that we are, by our confession, loyal to the gospel of Christ. The next part is vanguard. I'm not sure, I can't remember quite how I came across that other than I had some investments in something called Vanguard. And then I learned one day what it was. I was scrolling around and I came across the word and I thought this was, was a fascinating word. A Vanguard is the foremost part of an advancing army or naval force. Anyone in the Navy here? Anyone have a background, a Navy background? If you look at the photo of the naval force, you see one of the destroyers is out in front of an aircraft carrier. And there's a certain arrangement that they have in protection of that carrier. You have battleships, you have destroyers, and you have frigates and others that are around that carrier, and it becomes, at some point, a battle formation. Well, in the other picture, I happened to watch for the first time the Battle of the Five Armies in The Hobbit. How many of you have seen that? Do you remember that? Okay, okay. you guys are Hobbit fans or Lord of the Rings fans? Oh, you're missing something. But there is a scene in there where the, where the dwarves are holed up in, under the mountain that they're trying to protect, and the other dwarves are out fighting away for them, and Thorin is in there with his crew of 13 or 12 or 13 uh, dwarves, and finally, to make a long story short, they come out because their kinsmen are starting to lose the battle and Thorin is their king. And what do they do? The door opens and Thorin rushes the line of orcs, thousands of orcs there, and his men are following him and they form a point. And when I saw it, I thought, Vanguard, the foremost point of advancing army, that's what he's doing. And he hits into those orcs, and they start to divide them, and they're slashing and slaying, and yes, it works. He pushes right through. Eventually, as they push through, they come back around on the backside, and they destroy them all. It was a fascinating thing to watch. So, the idea then is this. It also refers to a group of people leading the way in new developments or ideas. Both meanings play a defining role in the idea or the purpose and mission of Evangelion, okay? The purpose. Well, as evangelical Christians, we hold to the Orthodox Confession, as we mentioned, of the Evangelical Lutheran Church. And all of that is in the Book of Concord for us, because it is a true exposition of Scripture. And it is a loyal to the Gospel of Jesus Christ right. So what, what is meant by this? If you think about it, if we really do believe in our confession, if we believe we have it right, and we should, it's not an arrogant thing, it's a humiliating or humble thing to know that we've been entrusted with that by faithful teachers from the past. We should embrace it and thank God for it and give our lives to keep it. So why would we not be, of all Christians, and there are a lot of them, not just in Lutheranism, there's Christians in all these denominations, why would we not be the foremost point of that advancing army against the gates of hell that will not prevail against the church if we hold this confession to be true? We have a tendency to hold back and be in the very back. That's in my view, what I see. Why would we not be out front leading the charge in our cultural issues, in bringing the kingdom into our community, and striving harder and harder for the kingdom that God has brought us in so gracefully? So that's the idea, event. Taking our role and responsibility and moving through this world as if we were the point of it. The purpose? We do so in service to the gospel. We seek to be an advancing point of the faith into the world. And we have these three things. Let me get to my, because this is going to be a little bit more explaining. And uh, we're already about halfway through. So, for the purposes of proclaiming the gospel into the world, at the same time, protecting it. And protecting it means exactly what the Book of Concord does. 
You are writing, and you are writing against the issues of your day, and you are providing uh, expositions that are faithful to the Bible in view of the cultural challenges that we have to pass on to the next generation. And then we preserve it. Notice in the picture that the man is sitting here with his daughter with the Bible in hand and talking with her about it. Preservation means passing it on to the next generation unadulterated in its purity, in all its beauty and wonder, and yes, in its hardness also. The Word of God is oftentimes hard for us, and we do so according to Deuteronomy for our children and our children's children. This means, make no mistake about it, that verse is telling us that as men in the family, it is our duty and responsibility to teach and to catechize our children, not to pass it off onto others as if we had no role in it. There will be others that teach our children that we entrust them to, but we are the primary teachers because we'll be the ones who answer for it to God and our children's children. We do everything we can to be a part of their lives and to provide the patriarchy that is needed in handing down the faith. Okay. So in his commentary of 1 John 5, verses 4 and 5, you were familiar with this already. I'll just quickly go through it. Dr. Luther writes, we are engaged in a battle, not with one prince or emperor, but with the whole world. Everywhere the devil has spiritual weapons with which he attacks the ministers of the word on the right and on the left. And I think Pastor Zeroff will tell you as well as I'll tell you that there, this is not an easy role to do because we feel the pressures of it, especially the burdens of caring for other people's souls in addition to our family and what that means. So there is, there is a burden that goes with that, but it's a blessing. For this reason, we now have so many adversaries, not only the fanatics, but the princes, popes, and the kings of the whole world, with all their adherents. Who will overcome all these? He, says John, who is born of God. And this is where he references back to 1 John. This must happen through faith in Christ, which is the victory. So what does this mean? And this is the center. He who believes in Christ is now a warrior. He overcomes, says John, not he has overcome. It means it's an ongoing overcoming in this world. But we are still engaged in the battle itself and are about to be victorious. Therefore, we are also admonished by Christ every day. Be strong in the Lord, he says, and do battle with the old serpent. It is the old serpent who introduces lies, heresies, and all the evils we see today, too. Notice in this, what Luther is revealing right there is what we're battling against. Lies, heresies, their manifestations in human flesh and cultural mores. Just as it was then, it is so today. This he has done from the beginning. God has placed us in the midst of wolves in the kingdom of the devil. So in other words, it's not going to be easy, and we shouldn't expect it to be, and we should expect to be attacked uh, relentlessly at times for what we stand for. As weapons, he has given us his word and spirit, and he tells us to do battle and to conduct ourselves as bold warriors under him himself as our prince, while he himself looks on and is also victorious. I think that last sentence means we are to look to our Christ, he is our Lord and our King, and we do his bidding, and we know that he already stands victorious over these enemies, and that also we are to see that and be encouraged by that as we encounter them in our lives for the sake of those around us. So what is, what is the purpose still? To be a league of men, a band of Christian brothers, to sharpen, as we heard before, as iron sharpens iron, to encourage one another, and you have the Bible verses you can look up for yourself if they're not already written out in the sample I gave you, and keep one another in faith and honor to God and our Christian calling as warriors and men of God. 
So this begins to lay out for us a map about how and why we would put something together like this. So at the core of it, at the core of it, then is the Bible verse, Ephesians 4, 11, and 5. And there's a couple of comments to be made on that. As he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers, for this purpose, okay, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood. I mean, this is what our calling is about as pastors to the men of the congregation and to the ladies and their womanhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And listen why. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. Why? Is the Christian church divided into so many denominational and so-called non-denominational shards in the world? Why is that when we have one word of God? I think in part this verse talks to us about it. About a real effort and understanding the need to reach maturity, to be mature men and measuring up the full stature. We can't make ourselves that. That's not what is meant here. But this is a becoming that God works in us through certain ways and means. But then we do act upon that in response. Okay? Tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, and that's what divides us. But the interesting thing is, if you read our confessions, it is enough, it says, for unity and fellowship that the Word of God be taught in all its truth and purity, and that the sacraments of God are instituted and administered according to, to, uh, to Christ, how He did it. So if you think about it, that's, those are the key things that divide us into all these different denominations. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into Him who is the head, into Christ. Okay. So, as we start to wrap this up a little bit, taking inspiration from Paul's exhortation and calling to be watchful, this is the, sort of the tagline that was meant to go with the evangelist. Stand firm in the faith, act like men. This is a Bible verse, mind you, so it's telling us this. Be strong. Act like men. Now the picture I chose on this one shows a single man standing among a charging war of enemies. But he stands. You see? One man. Because act like men, if you look at it, and you go back to its relationship to others when it comes back to Joshua, because it happens in Joshua's time, and said to Joshua, Act like men. It means this. Be courageous. Stand firm in the faith. Be strong. And so he does. Even if it's one. It's an amazing picture. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I do that because I, I actually like the picture. I think it's kind of funny. And we don't have any babies here, so the bottom should be a problem for us. Especially if you have, if you have kids. But I like, I like this. I think it's hilarious. The mission is to train, equip, and exhort men and boys in biblical masculinity to mature manhood in service to their God-given leadership roles in family, church, and society as written in Jude that we contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Okay? So, the means. Well, we have beautiful means. We have wonderful means. We have the Book of Concord. We have the divine service. We have word and sacrament. These are not these are not minimal things. We talk about them so they start to lose their meaning and power among us in this way that we no longer see them 
as what they are, even though they never change and give to us everything God always says. So in advancing the mission, the idea is to keep and hold fast to the Orthodox heritage and the practices and the traditions, while at the same time leading the way in exploring new developments and ideas that's faithful to our confession in addressing our unique time and age and cultural issues and challenges of our day, especially as it relates to masculinity and the roles of men. When I was doing this and working through this, I never at that time five years ago would have thought we would be where we're at now when it comes to the forcing of, of gender ideology to us and in everything that we're doing. The idea that we would have to honor somebody's adverse pronouns that, that don't match their biological, God-created genders, the idea that children, small children as, as, as young as three or four years old are, are being treated uh, for transgender issues and dysphoria, surgeries, I mean, it's, it's, it's remarkable how perverse and how devolving we continue to be. I mean, this wasn't even addressing those issues. I never thought we would, we would be so far off course and, and perverse as we become. But the idea at the time was to find some ways that we could gather together for different purposes and use these tools to help train and be trained. We have pastors to do the teaching, but there's also opportunities for laymen to do teaching and instructing in terms of, of occupational and vocational um, um, trades and life skills and experiences in life as well. There's opportunity for camps, and I sort of define them a little bit, not that they have to be that, but just to give some distinctions between ways of training. This would be for training in biblical masculinity to mature manhood. That's the basic that we would do. Then the idea of a quest. What is a quest? Well, here, for training in biblical masculinity to mature manhood, so there's a, there's a movement of training idea here where now you're going to focus in on something and you're going to begin to, to master it. Advances. This is specialized training and development of Orthodox Christian practices. In other words, when we look at our lives, there's other questions to ask in terms of the catechism. You have the what and the what does this mean? But what would be helpful to us today is to ask the questions, why is this important? The why, which is used to motivate the factor, and what does this look like? There's the how for you. What does it look like? So keep that in mind as we move forward. And then sabbaticals, I know Pastor Zara, but I could use one once in a while, but we're going to talk about that, for implementation of discipline and transformation. Okay? Of course, God is doing this work ultimately. What's happening on our part, as we'll hear tomorrow, is that we are engaging in it for that purpose. Okay. So there's just a few slides left. The focus. Look at the picture. Look at the picture. The men together and the boys learning to hunt a lion. In some cultures, a young man, in order to be initiated into manhood, and it's more than one culture, has to go out himself and kill a lion in order to be received back into the tribe as a warrior. And a man. Imagine the look on your wife's face if you tell your 12 year old, Well, I'm going to send him out to go kill a lion in order to come back and be a man. I'm not saying we do that, but I'm looking at it thinking there was a way and a time where you had to prove your manhood. You had to show it. You had to see that it was happening in you. It was a rite and a ritual and a, a, a movement of initiation. It is the high target of the vanguard at the time we put this together to get land, to construct a camp, 
designed for the purpose and mission of doing what we're talking about. And we saw it as an essential catalyst to the fulfillment of, of, of the vision of that. That's all under discussion that can be talked about. But at the time we thought it was important, where can we go where we can help our boys understand better and train them specifically, maybe in the context of, of a quest or an advance, and build them up over time? What does that look like? I don't think we have much of that in our society, and it might be helpful to be able to design something like that. I think this is the last one, yeah. Therefore, as the Apostle Paul charges and exhorts us, fight the good fight of the faith, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you gave the good confession in the presence of many witnesses to this end, so that at the end we can say, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Those are Paul's words. And right now, as we talk about this, one who has been so faithful to coming here, who's not able to be here, I think in his witness and testimony to me, and sometimes I think he ministers to me more than I minister to him, is David Norwood and what he's going through. And I think in his breaths, and soon he will have the last of them, that these could be spoken by him. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. And, and in part, you'll hear about that by what he has done in leaving a legacy to his family. It's quite amazing and impressive. And uh, taught me a lot about how I too can do that for my children. Gentlemen, we go to the very end. There's no retirement in Christianity. We do that in work in time, but also to give us opportunity to focus even more on the kingdom that God has put us in, so that we, to the very last breath, can also come to that point like Paul said, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. This is what we would like to see for our sons, I would imagine, too. So this is just an overview of an idea. That's all it is at this point. But I was hopeful in, in giving it to you that it would spark some conversation, it would spark some ideas, it would spark notes as we move along and look at it as an opportunity over the, over the next year in developing and building a men's ministry at, at Ascension. So with that, I'm just simply gonna ask if you have any comments you would like to make, anything you would like to add to it, question or, or um, give your thoughts on. do all these things through that organization. It mirrors our Lutheran confessions because whatever whatever church that troop is chartered through, it uh, absorbs the doctrine of that church. Uh, some of us have children that are involved in that. Uh, I think if we could do these things, we could have a camp, we could have teach life skills. Uh, some of us have skills here that little boys would love to know about. Uh, Austin could probably teach them about farming, for example. Uh, and you're, you're into radio. I mean, we have skills here. Little boys will just eat up. So uh, we have opportunities there already waiting for us to, to work through. Push, I'm not trying to push you into no, it, but I'm just saying yeah. it exists. Some of these things are already there. Uh, we take this, and we can do it now. We bought a trailer yesterday, so we can take these boys camping. Um, so this is an opportunity for I think the men of this church. Uh, you want to help you, and these are not necessarily Lutheran boys. You have an opportunity to show what it is like to be within the church to a non-Lutheran. And we're
teaching them things like the creeds and, and things out of the catechism to them, too. So, yeah, so just a thought. What, um, I've been involved in men's ministries before. Um, in my days of leaving the Lutheran Church, when I moved back out to Washington, I got involved in Promise Keepers. Do any of you remember that moment? Okay. And of course, you know, theologically, you, you figure out that while there are very interesting and good things happening there, it actually did bring my brother-in-law, who was not a Christian at the time, um, into the church uh, through seeing what was going on. However, you're going to find him today, even though he entered in that way, you're going to find him today one of your strongest Missouri Lutheran men in his church. And, and he's, he's very much uh, zealous for who and what we are as Lutheran men. So God can use even those means. Um, what I want to ask you, since I'm sure you've been involved with men's ministries, why, why do they oftentimes dwindle? Why do we lose interest? Exemplars and learning what that means and how that activity works. So Scott and I, just to have something down on paper, talked about uh, a way of, of, of a rhythm where we would have instruction, we'd have time off, and during that time we would have activities that we would do very specific to who and what we are around the church, around the homes, around the school, and other things uh, to help build those bonds and put to work our skills for the building of this kingdom. So, not so many meaning meetings, but when we do meet, they're meaningful. When we do meet, we do talk. But in between that, we build the fellowship through activities. That's one way of maybe um, lessening the monotony of it, if you will. What else? You've been involved. What was going to stop you from being here tonight that stopped so many other men from being here tonight? Schedules. Okay. Schedules? Yeah. I think the inclusion of our <clears throat> sons is important too. You know, because any any time that I'm not working is time away from my family. And so I, I guard that very closely. So I very much believe in what we're doing, especially as you mentioned the time that we're at and, and the point we're at with our school. I think this is a, a very, <clears throat> very applicable time where we're pushing pulling together. I also like the doing, and I think the the depth that you're gonna take us at is the Keepers, and I had some friends that did, but I just am not a real touch feely, emotional guy, I guess. And so I, I kind of liked your, your call to action, I'll say, in that sense. But I like doing things. I think we get together and we eat meat. We talk about, you know, we talk about what you have in front of you and we build things. I think that would be fun. Do, 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 do. Chuck some, chuck some spears, right? Right, chuck some spears, you do. <laughs> but like you said, Austin, you build things, meaningful things. Yeah, exactly. I remember when we started school here, and some of you also remember this too. Um, we, the problem that we had when we started the school was that we had more people show up to get things done than maybe what we even had to do. People were just taking on things. You know, it's, this needs to be done, it got done. And, and maybe that's the kind of thing that we need to regenerate again. Uh, we're talking about the possibility of making a change uh, to the school. That would be an opportunity for all the men in the congregation to maybe to, to come forward and, and do what needs to be done. We have Trail Life. We have 
sports, uh, uh, athletics. There's things that need to be done to the building. Teachers might need to, men should be able to come in instead of reach with the young men. Read stories to them, read down the Bible to them. Uh, it's a powerful thing. I sit with my grandsons and read them all the time. You know, I'll sit in a chair and they'll start reading me book after book after book. And that's, they crave that. So, I mean, those are, there's a lot of stuff that we could be doing. Uh, I think the benefit of the church, the benefit of the school, to, uh, and, and that's where the children are. And that's what we're talking about here, is raising these children up into being uh, men and women of the church. Sometimes topics and teachings just seem to drone on and on without like a sense of beginning and ending, something very pointed, very specific, very gravelable, very implemental. Um, maybe that's you know, on the teaching side, taking one little thing at a time and just going through the whole thing and then and looking at it in terms of implementation. So it feels like you're getting something out of it. You are not just an ongoing uh, like, a, like we were talking about, a droning happening. Um, Pastor Zura, what's been your, your experience, one way or the other? Maybe in why men participate, maybe why they don't participate. So um, I, I would watch it grow from three men to six to twelve, and uh, and I took a call to a larger congregation, and and I said one of the first things I'm going to do is to start another men's group, and that, that church had sixteen hundred. study and, and fellowship, it developed more into, uh, into closer relationships among the men. I, I, I visited with Buckley and Craig here and, uh, of course, David. Uh, you know, I got to know these three men better, better than I had before because I just wanted to sit down with you guys, not, not, not the clicks, clicks, guys, but, <laughs> but to sit with new men and get to know them and introduce myself as one of their pastors, and, and uh, I got to know these three guys better. Just, just to say hello, what you're doing, what's your job. Uh, you're a Purdue fan, okay, you can sit over there. No, you know. <laughs> no. no. Uh, so I think that's the two secrets. The two secrets is the word of God and fellowship. And all the doing does come later, because then, yeah. then you get to a point, which is where we're getting to very soon, is, Pastor Geyer has taught us for a year. Now what? We're near the end of the book, right? It's a fabulous book. We're going to study some of it tomorrow. But now what? 
we got to start doing something, right? And, uh, and so we've been trained to now be uh, in a particular uh, trajectory in ascension, what, what the needs are here. With the family ministry kind of official cook kickoff this Sunday, uh, that dovetails just nicely in what Pastor Geyer teaches in the men's ministry. And uh, we'll, we'll kick that off uh, this Sunday. Um, uh, but uh, you're, you're right. It's just, I think it's the yearning that men have to, to uh, be with other men. That is, other, other Christian men, other church men, share similar joys and temptations. And we know we're together in this battle. And we need to know that. Right. We're not alone in this battle. And the struggle that we share. So, uh, um, and, and you'll get all kinds of guys in a group. You know, you'll, you'll get the, the, the talkative ones, the quiet ones. Uh, you know, all kinds of games in a group like this. And we all need each other. It's the body of Christ. And uh, uh, you have to think study, uh, we come together for fellowship, we come together for encouragement, and we come together, well, training is another good word, right. training uh, to fight in that battle, and, uh, and then there's food and fun, and there's all the other good stuff that surrounds it, and, and that's important too, and, uh, uh, and then the, the beer will fall one day, <laughs> chili, chili without a beer, I are we Lutheran or what? What is this? Did I go to a Baptist church? Or is this a Lutheran church? What are we doing? It's, it's in the Constitution, so someone has to stand up and make a, a motion. And the next one. You mean, <laughs> there is a way around it, right? You mean we're going to have grape juice for communion now? Is that what you're saying? No, it actually accepts that. <laughs> I guess we could call this a voters meeting. All in favor. Bye. Bye. There's more people here than at a voters meeting. Yeah, have an idea. I guess I'm missing Mark. It's all over. Yeah, I like uh, everything I heard because I, 
with invention, we're not here to change the world, we're not. And if you think about how the world tries to approach everything, that your life is not meaningful unless you're doing something in your part to change the world. The world's not going to change, it's going to be what it is. And, and when you get that load taken off of you, and this is where, where tomorrow I, I will talk a little bit more about focus. It's like taking this huge thing that he's talking about, this huge burden that you have, and then narrowing that down to what God has given to you. And when that happens, then you start to realize, I have a real purpose that is very pointed, directed, and has very tangible um, uh, output to it, or uh, things that you see in that life. And the only thing that you can take to heaven around you is your family. Now, if God calls you to be a pastor, like Pastor Zerov is, and, and I am, that means that our, our vocation is going to now include teaching and instructing you while you're out doing your occupations in the world of being a policeman, right? Or being an accountant, or being an architect, or being anything that you're gonna farmer, doing all those God-given things in support of our roles as men in community. So I think you're right, it gets overwhelming if you think you gotta change the world. You're not gonna change the world. The world is devolving, it will continue to do so, but the Christian church is the saving grace of God and the kingdom of God that we are to be about as Christian men. We're to be building the kingdom. It's God building the kingdom through us, but that means with very focused efforts. I like that because now something becomes more doable for us and we take the, the weight of the world off our shoulders. I like that. Yeah, yeah. And, and, uh, our family ministry group, I, I just emphasize that, that we, we just start off rather small steps. And then after three, four years, you look back and you see, wow, a lot has been accomplished. But, but you can't tackle everything all at once, and you want to, but you can't. And it seems to be moving slowly. But that's the way the church is, that things move slowly. But there's a purpose behind everything. And eventually, eventually God leads you to a, a better place, step by step. That's our book for tomorrow. We have two chapters we'll go through. Pastor Zerov is going to also uh, model and bring about how, how to do, how to do devotions in the home and uh, what that looks like and can look like. Uh, I'm going to introduce a few tools that I think are helpful to men that, that in our tool chest of how we organize and strategize and do things, a little bit of that can go a long way even for Christian men as they want in their vocation. So why don't we end right there since we're going to be picking up again in the morning and we didn't want to go real late tonight and I'm hopeful that we can uh, enjoy the time that we've had here and get ready for some of the teaching tomorrow. So why don't we rise and just pray that we just pray together in closing and then if you want to hang around a little bit and chat, you're more than welcome to. Uh, if you want to hang around a little bit and help us clean up, that would be nice as well. And you know, we can all get home at a reasonable time. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 